So I want to dive into the quick pre-debate discussion and ask, I, I know I'm going to get, go more towards the you know, negative side of it here and say there's a lot of resistance, I think, on both sides of having uh, towards having these debates saying they're, they can be unproductive or you're, you're never going to change the, dem- uh, the mind of your opponent. Uh, we've been talking about these questions for thousands of years and we're, we're still debating the same questions. Who was Jesus? Was there a God? Things of that nature. So why do we do these types of debates? What's, I mean, what's the reason behind it um why don't you take that well i think debate is an important way to uh, actually have to test ideas and so um if you're only speaking to people that already agree with you or if you're only reading or listening or hearing people that already agree with you then you're really not testing what you're saying sort of in the in the world of ideas and you don't really allow for real challenges and that makes us ask is it really a strong idea so I think debate helps us do that out in the open. So it's not, it's uh, hopefully it's not one-upmanship. It's not merely some kind of competition, you know, an intellectual version of boxing. Hopefully, it's something more like trying to let the truth win out. Hopefully, that's uh, why people would be interested in this. Yeah, one would hope. Uh, that's that's yeah, that's the best thing for it. I mean, I, I, nothing can get resolved in a time debate because I mean, there's lots of limitations here. You can't like fact check claims. You can't. Uh, you know, consider your words carefully. Or you, you can't sit down and think, like, what's the most important point to make? Because uh, you have to respond immediately, right? Uh, but if, if you know the material, you know the subject, debates can be a good opportunity to educate the audience on things they wouldn't have heard otherwise. And more people will come to listen to a debate than would come listen to your lecture, for example. Diver- more diverse people will listen to a debate. Um, so I see debates as sort of entries into the debate rather than a resolution of the topic. Um, so, so they have a utility as as long as both parties are going to be, you know, honest and and not try to game the system. Well, makes sense. And I know we uh, a debate is to a degree a competition, but I think if we go into uh, a a format like this uh, to address a topic with more of an academic approach, I think yeah. it can be very fruitful. But there's there's always going to be that argument that uh, I mean, it's not going to change the mind of your opponent for one, which would be incredible if that happened during a <laughs> debate. But uh, that. The audience has come in with their preconceived notion on one side or the other, and they're they're just there to see a fight. They're they're there to see oh, a boxing yeah, match, happens. as Vocab put mm-hmm. it. Uh, so, I mean, what what do you two think about that? I mean, is there is this something you typically encounter, or yes. is there some? Um, of course, that's a defect of their character, but. Uh... <laughs> Uh, I, Insult I have, the audience. <laughs> that's, how we, that's how we do it. A classic example of that is I did um, I did two debates with Mike Lacona, um, and the second debate was actually I, I, my favorite. Everybody loves the first debate because of the the complete annihilation that I affected with the slides, right? So everybody was like, oh, you really got him. Because uh, it was one of those things where I had a slide for everything. So you would ask a question and you thought it was a gotcha question. And I would just shout out the number of the slide and it would be the slide that answers this question. And at some point in the, in the debate, uh, the moderator himself said to Mike, Mike you, you, you're going to need some more slides, I think. <laughs> but, uh, but everybody loved that because of that. But I thought that that was still a kind of combative debate and and you know I, I defended my position and all of that stuff and so technically it was fine but it, it I just thought it was more argumentative rather than making progress amongst each other as to why we believe what we do and when we did the second debate it was we sat on basically you know comfy chairs in front of an audience and had more like a conversation uh, and the d- debate organization the structure of it was more about um, un- trying to understand like why do you believe this right so rather than like can I win this argument it was more of the why do we think what we think and then what what is our reaction to that so I thought a lot more progress was made in that debate I thought that was a much more useful debate however there were several people who were reporting some of the attitudes of some of the Christians who came to that and and the Christians were really pissed off that Mike didn't stick it to me that it was that he was that he was nice and polite, and that we we were making progress with uh, uh, with these with the discussion. But they were expecting some sort of like knockdown. Ooh, we should come, we should get that atheist kind of thing. And so they were disappointed that it wasn't a boxing match. Whereas I thought that was a much more productive debate. So um, so yes, I've had experience with that as being a perception. That works for me. <laughs> <laughs> Just agreement. All right. This is uh, – it's too early to be agreeing. They always – no, no, no. It's, it <laughs> it's always, not true at all. It should, kidding, it kidding. It always starts out that way. It's later on, you know. Mm. <laughs> well, true it, statement. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Debates always get more uh, rancorous as they go on because the clock is running out. Yeah. And, and 
Yeah. <laughs> oh, good point. Good point. I've well, seen that happen. Many I, times. I'm I'm looking forward to using the. Uh, I mean, the the cross examination uh, period is going to be fun, but I think the the Q and A is going to be a good time for some discussion yeah, on right? some of the questions, mm-hmm. so we can really see some awesome interplay uh, between the two of you, and hopefully wrap up on on the the positive. We can d- agree to disagree, but still have a yeah, fruitful and discussion on this type of stuff. Definitely remind the audience all the ways they can ask those questions because you you really want an audience driven Q and A, right? So. Um, I, they might not know that they can jot down questions and notes as the debate goes along, and then how can they tr- re- relay them to you? Well, um, if you uh, want to get the questions to us, you can tweet at UNB Radio. That's uh, at UNB Radio. Forrest will be manning the Twitter feed, and you can also give us a call when we get to the Q&A ses- session. We'll be uh, taking calls at 415-484-1601. All right. Well, uh, we're nine minutes into to this segment. I wanted to spend a little more time talking about the value of debate um, before we, we really dive into it. But um, I think a more pertinent question that people might be uh, thinking about is I mean, not so much why do we debate, why is debate important, but why do we debate this question in particular of who is Jesus? What makes this an important question to discuss in today's society? Well, of course, if we were in Iran, we'd be debating uh – Islam or something like that. If we the, were the Iran, correct interpretation of the prophet or we something would like that. We'd be debating nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, this is valid, yeah. Uh, there are a certain amount of limits to what they would allow there. Um, but, uh, but no, the, the point being is that uh, Christianity is one of the driving central forces in our culture in the West. It affects our politics. It affects our communities. It affects the, the life and society we move through. Uh, so understanding Christianity gets a lot of attention and interest for that reason from both sides of that debate. Um, although this particular subject, the really the only reason I'm interested in it is that I'm a historian and I was paid to be interested in it. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the story is, is that uh, when I got my PhD in 2008, the economy collapsed. And so PhD jobs for my field in humanities were not uh, – they were basically uh, eliminating them or putting freezes on them. So I went to um, – to my fans and said, you know, I'll apply my PhD to any problem you want me to do if you can raise enough money to cancel my student debt, which at the time was really small, only twenty thousand um, dollars, because I had scholarships and fellowships for the rest of it. And um, so I did that, and everybody unanimous, and they raised the twenty grand, and unanimously they all said, uh, "The historicity of Jesus. We want you to do like a definitive." study of that like is it does there merit to it or not and so i said yeah sure i'll do that uh, and so i did uh and it was a really fascinating research project took six years to complete uh, i learned a lot uh and was surprised that i wasn't able to find good enough evidence to shore up the historicity claims for jesus and also interested in all the other things i found in terms of understanding better the actual origins of christianity and its its political and social context that what the christians as the first as the jewish sect that they were what those jews were actually trying to accomplish with the religion is interesting so so it was very uh, beneficial for me and the result is that now you know i'm the go-to guy because I, I spent six years studying this with you know at the phd level so um and i'm happy to talk about it and that's why i'm here let me answer theologically uh <laughs> yes <laughs> as i should um people are made in god's image they have uh, a desire to have what they think at some level although i would say there's a lot of irrationality in human nature at some level what they believe match the way they understand the world. That's a product of being made in God's image. Now, of course, I believe in the noetic effects of sin, meaning our rational capacities will embrace certain irrationalities for the reason of passions, actually sort of like what Hume seemed to think. However, we still drive towards the truth every now and then. That's one thing. So it's something everyone should care about, period, the truth. That's what I'm saying by that. Secondly is if uh, if... I turn to Acts 4.12, for example. It says, there's no other name given to men under heaven by which they may be saved. Ultimately, what I would want people to see is not just merely Jesus' existence, some kind of bare, minimal existence. I know people argue for that. I don't really actually think that's very interesting or does much for the discussion. <laughs> I don't really think anyone believes that hardly, except for some folks, yes. But, so, but you have people arguing that way. Jesus Christ as Savior, as risen Savior, did Jesus Christ rise from the dead? Is he the means that God has provided to reconcile men and women back to their creator? That's an important question. Now, obviously, if there's no God, that's all that's all a a miss. uh, Miss. That's those are sort of misplaced priorities. But that's why it's important to me to say who was Jesus. 
Well, and uh, I, within, I mean, with your frame, within your framework there, I, that's a perfectly valid way to look at it. If there is in fact a God, this relationship between this character and that deity and that deity and us is an important thing to consider. Right. So. Sometimes people will say that um, the grace of God, or maybe they'll put it this way, the justice and mercy of God kiss at the cross. And what that means is that you see God displaying his wrath on sin, so it's not like... Uh, it's he doesn't care about it. He's sweeping it under the rug. There's a, a rug. There's an objective basis for why he can forgive those he's made in his image. But yet you see his mercy displayed as well. Now, I understand, for example, you guys got Spencer. He's not able to be here today. He would say that whole thing is like marketing. You need the product. So first, let me tell you your need. Or he would say uh, Christian theology is what's actually delusional because it says there's something wrong with us because it has a doctrine of sin. I understand that, but I'm not going to, I mean, I'm going to answer as a Christian, because I are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right, well, that's, uh, I think that, well, clears up that question. You no, like my I grammar, was, Forrest? I are. I was, uh, I didn't know if I should <laughs> mention it or not. That's what actually, you know, sort of, like, drove me off the edge there, where I couldn't speak for a sec coming I, back, was I, the I are. Like, I, do I, I say something about I that? I did it for Forrest. He smiled. That was the whole reason. That, that was actually, just for Forrest? I got my uh, Spinoza exam back, and I got 101%. Oh, so. So I had nothing to do with me saying, this guy's just, can this guy leave? Sorry, I'm just kidding. He's smiling about Spinoza, not not about bad grammar. Okay, that's Uh, cool. uh. Um, so I want to. Uh, I, I do want to uh, throw a, a follow up question on the uh, mm-hmm. mythicist side of it. And I know the uh, up until recently, and re- recent um, by recently, I mean actually quite recently in the uh, recent years since uh, you've begun your research, and uh, David Fitzgerald's been writing. Uh, the mythicist position isn't something that was really uh, widely taken seriously, and it would seem that there wasn't really a lot of uh, good academic work uh, that was being done, uh, perhaps with a uh, with a secular approach. We and we've mm-hmm. just sort of been uh, we've been uh, living in the society that's just accepted uh, that there was a Jesus, and then academics have it seems to me have worked within that framework. What are yeah. your thoughts about that? Because it seems to be gaining traction. Uh, yeah. Um and that's really a different question in terms of why it gains traction. I, I don't think it, it's one of those examples where I think its popularity is often driven by non-rational reasons um, and <clears throat> by you know people who really don't know the actual body of evidence. I mean, I've had people tell me, you know, the, the Gospels are obviously bogus, therefore clearly Jesus didn't exist. And I would have to explain, well, that's actually a non sequitur. Like, even if the Gospels were completely mythical, there could still be evidence for Jesus. So, um, but there, I think there's a certain resonance uh, about this. And I think a lot of it, especially among ex fundamentalists, right? Uh, so, and, and validly, a lot of ex fundamentalists feel betrayed and lied to, and they have been. Um, so, there's a lot of a lot of their uh, hostility to the idea of the, these claims that are defended by, by fundamentalist Christians, they love seeing that they fall apart on examination. So the idea that Jesus didn't exist is another one of those examples of where, where the, the evidence that is used by fundamentalists to defend the historicity of Jesus is often terrible. And so that just re- fuels the fire of, oh, look, here they are at it again, betraying us, lying to us again. So that, that kind of outrage drives interest in the subject. Um, so I, I, And there are other aspects of this, too. But um, in terms of the scholarship, uh, there actually were some pretty good defenses of the idea early in the 20th century. Uh, and then critics came back and ignored all the good arguments and destroyed all the bad arguments. And there were some bad arguments. And then cl- declared victory and then moved on. Uh, and uh, academically, that made no sense, but that's just the way it had occurred inside academia. Uh, and then uh, you have people like uh, Robert Price and G.A. Wells started resurrecting the idea. Uh, and then you had a, a – that became very popular among amateur uh, historians. So on the internet and things like that, you get a lot of this. And then like a lot of cranks – for example. Yeah, a lot of cranks glommed on. You know, uh, Joseph Atwill is an example of, of someone who probably is not mentally well uh, and is advocating a ridiculous conspiracy theory version of the Jesus myth theory um, that is, uh, you know, 99% nonsense. Um, and so you get that. But And then, of course, he has tons of cash, so he, you know, promotes his stuff everywhere. And so it gets a lot of attention. So you have all of these factors combining at the same time. But what has also happened is, you know, when I did my research and I found out that a lot of the stuff that was done by Robert Price, and then most importantly, Earl Doherty's book. Earl Doherty's book, um, he has a a bachelor's degree in in classics. He wrote this book, The Jesus Puzzle. 
that actually was a pretty good defense of the myth theory that, that unlike anything I'd seen before, it was properly academic and, and pretty well argued in research. It had some flaws, but uh, that was the thing that made me realize that, okay, he's asking some really good questions that aren't being answered by mainstream academia. Uh, and so that really inspired me once I started doing the research uh, for these two books that I came out with. Uh, well, three if you count uh, Hitler Homer. So I have Proving History, Hitler Homer, Bible Christ, and then On the Historicity of Jesus, which is the the, the book everybody's interested in. So when, once I was doing that and then I've been promoting that for the last six years or more, yeah, about six years since I've been doing the project, that has es escalated interest. So people like Hector Avalos, uh, professor of biblical studies, has come out saying, you know, I see the arguments balanced pretty evenly. I'm a historicity agnostic. Um, so that's a pretty big revelation. And then there are other authors like who are bona fide experts in the field like uh, Thomas Thompson, who's a renowned uh, professor emeritus in biblical studies. Uh, Thomas Brody, a Catholic uh, professor of biblical studies, um, who remains Catholic and yet still argues that Jesus didn't exist. Um, and he has a whole chapter in his book about how that makes sense. But that's theology. I'll leave that, I'll leave that aside. Uh, so it, there are an increasing number of voices of people who are actually insiders now um, saying this. So, so things things have changed a bit, and so it's become more it's becoming more academic and rigorous in this defense. And it, there's just resistance among mainstream academia. We're working to uh, overcome that, and which is often the case with any major change in academia. Oh, when sure, a, yeah. an opinion that's largely accepted. Sometimes it takes a bit of a fight, but I mean, if the yeah, well, especially yeah. when all the funding dollars are generally controlled by Christians. So that so I, I disagree <laughs> with a lot of Richard's assessment of the state of New Testament scholarship. Mm -hmm. One of my problems I see, I'm not saying everybody, uh, but a lot of people I find who pick up on the history of the city of Jesus, some of your other books along this, or they see a debate, a lot of times it's their introduction to New Testament scholarship. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're atheists, they have an interest in this thing a lot of times. Yeah. They're, they're bright people, but they, they uh, I'm not saying I'm the expert, I work at UPS during the day, okay? But what <laughs> I am saying is that it's their introduction. Yeah. And so they have to kind of be like blind men inside counting on you as the weatherman who's able to go outside and report to them the conditions of what the weather is, what hail's like, what snow is like. I think you're super smart. I don't think you're the greatest weatherman, if, if the analogy <laughs> holds. And so I would challenge people, even if you have a predisposition to dig what he's saying, you've got to read some other books by, sure. yeah, by well, the absolutely. moderates and by the so-called fundamentalists because there's a lot more rigorous stuff going on. And here's what I've noticed within sort of this other uh, this this New Testament scholarship world is that some of the most hardcore attacks against you actually are by a lot of times atheist or agnostic leaning New Testament scholars. For yeah, example, like Bart Hoffman. Ehrman. Well, Ehrman, well, Hoffman, it's true to a certain yeah. extent, uh, Ehrman, but I don't find him actually the most like. Um, sort of go for the throat, in my opinion, in the way that he wrote with you. Maybe you feel differently. But to me, Hoffman, i was been reading his stuff, even Casey, yeah, well, reading their stuff. You and, should, you and should the know the Jesus that, Process blogs, have you seen those? Yeah, but you should know about Hoffman that he's he has a paranoid delusion about me. So he, okay. he actually thinks that I'm a, I've been paid by his enemies to attack him and destroy him. I don't know if that's true. He's, All I know He said it, I mean, in his own words. But, so uh, but, but I, <laughs> so I, I don't think he's mentally well. But this is someone... So who, I, I don't really consider him a critic worth looking at. I, I would look at Bart Ehrman. I would look at, well, Mark Goodacre, uh, Zebra Crook, who's a professor of New Testament right. studies I that heard, I debated. But my um, larger point is proceed with caution. Never, even if oh, they... Oh, sure. I would recommend to everybody To the person that. listening, please don't just read OHJ. Uh, that's, you know, how you abbreviate on it. Mm -hmm. Please read some other books in this field before you just jump into it and see it. Read books by people like Bear Ben Witherington, Daryl Bach. Read books by Bart Ehrman on this. Yeah. Just get a broader taste of the field before... But step outside. Don't just trust the weatherman. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm just going to sure. say that. I agree with that. Oh, yeah. Well, there's a lot of data to absorb. I mean, this has yeah. been a question that we've been, we've been after for quite some time. So, I mean, we... I, I, I complete. I'm. I completely agree with that. I'm not the academic, uh, the academic or expert on on Jesus in the room. But uh, there's a lot of differing opinions, and if it's something that's academically sound, it should be worthy of consideration by someone who really wants an answer to the question. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, I want to. Uh, we we will be diving into the debate the debate here really shortly. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to close with a wrap. You're good to go. All right, and that's the intro to the song. Ready? All right, turn up a little bit more, yo. 
Word la gas managana, stay yas on top of the cosmos. He's got his son, Mark Tong on the cross. He leave the na 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 for the one that's lost. Fill in the word, the good shepherd. He rose like a bird upon a third. Will in the day's work, he is superb. Bring good news to those who ain't heard. Crushing the serpent, suffering, serving. Healing the deserted, forget the perverted. Let me revert it. God the son, son of every gun through a virgin. Come, low mass of and curious. Zeal for the house, made the furious. Throughout the thief, so serious. Yet with the ones, there he was. Heaven sent down the best of him. Never could death get the best of him For three days he was resting in Special on sin at the resurrection Men from the east bring frankincense A king of king, never little infant He's got a man, 100% upon his shoulder The government, son of man And the door went away, he's the life and the truth And the lord who was saved, he's the bread and the hair With the eyes of a blaze, he's coming as a king on judgment day First and the last and the lamb who was slain He's Christ the Messiah with a tattooed name Well, for well, so knees will bend Pilate, Herod, Caesar, all of them Man is manna, shout Hosanna, wave a banner Ask what manna, the man is manna a shout Hosanna, wave a banner, ask what man a man is this who could calm the storm, gift of God, got flesh, got born, one more verse and we're done. Can you handle it, Andre? Ah, ah, let's do it. More than the temple, never simple. Kept it simple for the kinfolk. Joseph's tomb was like a rental. Up a room, new covenantal righteousness. He's a mighty, yes, he's Christ Jesus. Hope, trust, root, shrub, Emmanuel. Branch the one, he's David's son. Hope on the lion, hope of Zion. Great high priest who was died and rising. Judge and mercy, love and prayer. Be fall at his feet, say worthy, worthy. Prince of peace, prince in his feet. Die with the least to slay the beast. Gentile Jew for the west to east was bruised and beast. Could stay deceased. Rants on the Lamb and the sacrifice, point of Messiah, King and Christ, prophet, priest, source of peace, substance, meaning, all of the feast. Son of man and the door went away, he's a life and a truth and the Lord who will save. He's a bread in the head with the eyes of a blaze. He's coming as a king on judgment day. <laughs> <laughs> that was less than five minutes. Somehow the time you were perfect. I've never heard that beat before. Less than five minutes, right? Yeah, that yeah. Was no, yeah, damn good. <laughs> Someone's going to be upset at you guys. Like, you just let a Christian spew propaganda via hip-hop ah, all on your show. <laughs> it's Christian art, right? So That was fun. Oh, I spew man. worse stuff on that. That was show. awesome. Oh, yes, he does. Oh, uh, man. I kind of invited to be on a clip segment specifically for it. Uh, so thank you again for, for taking the time to listen, for putting up with the disconnects. It's been a lot of fun having really? both of you in studio. Wasn't Look at so there. Thanks well, a thousand for the invite. I really actually did feel honored when you asked me to be on. 